Tommy was still a name, and Don King arranged a multi-million dollar payday for Tommy on a three-fight deal. I had just signed a uh, $38.5 million contract. Uh, it's a three-fight contract with, uh, with Don King. Win or lose, Tommy would be set for life after his next match. Only this time, he didn't even make it to the ring. Uh, when they sent me to take a test and uh, what started all this. A few hours before the fight, he was going through his normal pre-bout routine. A walk along the strip to relieve the jitters. I'm going to get off first and beat him to the punch. You had a left hook, was really a, a murderous hook, and uh, I was scared then. I'm only frightened this time. <laughs> Low blow from Foreman and a good left hook by Morrison. Two good left hooks by Tommy Morrison, and George didn't move. He beat Razor Ruddock. He stopped him, dropped him with a big left hook. Tommy Morrison had a nasty left hook. There's the left hand. Jake goes down and probably out. He hit me hard. I've ever been hitting boxing. Out of it. Get that the referee set. Oh. If that thing, if that thing, which is that left hook, if it land on anybody, you're going to sleep. I'm not exactly right, though. Hello. Oklahoma City, I'm sorry. Hello. Yes, Oklahoma City. Hi. Hi, I'm Mike Tyson. Duke. That's how. Arson and his bump. Uh, and the guy, he was actually whooping my ass for three rounds. I mean, he hit me harder than I've ever been hit before for three rounds. Get out of it. Get that the referee set. I just didn't want the guy to hit me no more. He was hitting me. I was farting in the ring, farting in the ring, farting in the ring. Initially, the recovery went great. Tommy had a lead HIV specialist doctor nursing his health. He took his pills regularly and began transforming his broken and weak body back to full fitness. That was until he met his soon-to-be wife, Trisha in the late 2000s. He couldn't talk to people. His wife wouldn't let anybody near him. Tommy had convinced himself and others around him that he didn't just no longer have AIDS, but he never had the virus in the first place. There's so much controversy follows me around everywhere I go. You know, people have a hard time believing that they made a mistake back 12 years ago. But they did. And Tommy Morrison's proposed return to the ring. To consider the issue, we welcome Mark Ratner, the executive director of the Nevada State Athletic Commission, and Dr. Gary Cohan, an AIDS physician. First, Mark, uh, Tommy cannot fight in Nevada. Tommy Morrison can't be licensed there. How many states will follow that lead, and where could this fight take place? Uh, there are only five states in America that do not have boxing commissions. I would assume, and I only can speak for the state of Nevada officially, but I would assume all boxing states that have commissions would not allow him to fight. But you know the boxing industry. There's a chance this could happen, isn't there? There's always a chance. Yes. Occur. Would Nevada, which is, of course, along with New Jersey, one of the leading, the leading states in boxing, possibly take sanctions against those that uh, would take part in it if they were then to come back and try and fight in Nevada later in their career? Uh, what we would do, is, I mean, it's very simple when it comes to, uh, to Tommy. Uh, one of the conditions of licensure in our state is that you must be HIV negative, so therefore he cannot fight in Nevada. Uh, whoever he fought uh, at that time, we, we would take it up, but uh, I will not say uh, definitively that we would stop him from fighting the opponent. So, Mark, as a boxing professional, in a, in a phrase, describe Morrison's decision today. Uh, to me, uh, somewhat surprising, though I guess uh, maybe I shouldn't be surprised about anything in boxing. Uh, I just know in our state, uh, we're very, very strict. We've uh, been testing since 1988, and uh, we do not want uh, HIV-positive fighters to... We Nevada made it clear they would not allow Morrison to fight in his present condition. The National Centers for Disease Control have never received a report of HIV transmission through sports. The tests are negative. Um, it's hard to, uh, to hold him to a higher standard when he's proving to us that both the antibody and the virus are not in his body. All right, gentlemen, thanks very much. I know these are difficult questions for both of you to answer. You answered them very well. My name is Chris, and I am with Top Level Media. Trisha married to Tommy Morrison and how are you Trisha? Doing good thank you Chris good. how are you? I am good I'm good, uh, good. it's just about, it's about Christmas time and I'm ready to go for Christmas. <laughs> yep Christmas 2021 right? I think so 2021 definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah for sure. 
So, um, uh, I gotta ask, you know, um, how are things going with you, you know, as far as Tommy Case goes, just because basically um, there's a lot that I want to go into with Tommy's case and stuff like that. Good. Yeah, I'm glad. Okay, so the case was filed on July 24th, 2014. We're almost into the eighth year of the case, Chris. I know you've been following quite a bit, so have many people all over the world. Um, where we're at right now is we're back in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal. Um, so from 2014 through till 2021, we did um, quite a judicial circuit. We started off at the federal court in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Then we went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco. Then we went to the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Right. Then, then we went back to federal court in Las Vegas, Nevada. Mm -hmm. And now we're back again in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco, waiting on a decision. And the motion that stands in front of the court is motion for DNA HIV testing on newly discovered preserved tissue right. and biological evidence belonging to Tommy. Right. Now, um, back in 96, for anybody that does not know, um, Tommy lost his license to box. And do you want to explain how that took place and stuff? Right. Yeah. Actually, I was in Las Vegas in 1996. So um, I was working in tourism at the time. Mm. Um, I wasn't with Tommy, but I was part of um, part of the crowd in Las Vegas when they made the announcement that um, this Tommy Morrison, right, um, was not going to be fighting that night. And then, of course, the media came out with um, that he had tested positive for HIV and that he was uh, suspended indefinitely worldwide immediately from boxing. And that was basically it. So that's what happened. And um, that was February um, 1996. Right, right. And for anybody that doesn't know that Tommy's been in the media for a long, long time as, you know, um, Tommy from Rocky Five, he's been, he has a mean right hook. I love that right hook of his and stuff because he could really punch <laughs> and yeah. stuff. And um, basically- He was a threat. He was a threat in the boxing world. Really. Right. Right, right. Now, um, you know, um, when that was going on and Tommy, they said that Tommy had, uh, ha it was diagnosed with AIDS. He was 26, right? Yeah, he just turned 27. Yeah. Right, right. And um, as, as somebody in the media myself, I can't really speculate and say way too much, but I can say that, you know, um, you know, he was supposed to fight Mike Tyson and stuff. And basically, and all that, it, it's just a coincidence and how he was supposed to fight Mike Tyson and all this comes out, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And you know what, Chris, um, I wasn't brought up in, in the boxing world, right? Um, but throughout this case, I've learned a lot. And you're right, this was his first fight that he had um, signed with Don King. And it was the first fight that he was kicked out of boxing. And the contract that Tommy had with Don King um, had him on a collision course with Mike Tyson, um, which obviously never happened and, you know, speculation or whatever. But Tommy did say to me that um, he would have beaten Mike Tyson uh, in 96, 96, 97, because Mike Tyson was just coming out of uh, jail. 
Um, and Tommy told me how he would have beaten him. <laughs> right, exactly. It's kind of like going into a store and saying like you stole something, took something, or, you know, you did something that you didn't do, but somebody's saying that you did and stuff. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, you, you can't really blame somebody without proof and stuff, right. you, you know, I right. mean and stuff and so what i'm saying is it's like um did they have any proof that tommy was diagnosed with hiv <laughs> so you know that is a really good question and right in front of me are all these court documents that are actually in front of the ninth circuit court and let me tell you that there is no proof um, of any clinical or physical diagnosis of HIV AIDS at all from anyone from 1996 through to Tommy's death. Okay. And you can read that in every single document um, in this case. And the lab report that they um, uh, produced in this lawsuit pertaining to that testing, Chris, for 1996 had um, the wrong physician's name on it mm -hmm. and was not signed off by a pathologist, which by their code of federal regulations has to be. Um, they listed a physician that didn't even exist. They used a marker um, to say that he had P31 in his blood where the FDA and the CDC had dropped the P31 marker which uh, would have classified you as having HIV. They dropped that two, three years ago. Then on the lab report, um, which is again now in front of the um, Ninth Circuit Court, it shows that the blood was frozen. It was in the toxicology freezer. You don't test frozen blood, right? And um, you don't store blood in a toxicology freezer if you're going to be testing it. And then another thing is that $23 test, which is what it was in those days, um, was actually a laboratory developed test, an LDT, which under federal um, FDA regulations is not approved. Right, because I've actually talked to some family members about Tommy's incident, just because um, I've come from, a, come from a family full of nurses and, oh. and so having that knowledge, I know what you exactly are talking about and what you mean. You, yeah. You just can't really freeze it. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. So. Exactly. You know, and all this stuff, you know, you come from a family of, you know, nurses and stuff like that. Um, I've researched all this and this is all the information that's coming to me directly from the lab, the physicians, the FDA, the CDC, the test kit manufacturers. I'm basically, Chris, the messenger. I'm basically putting everybody's information together and putting it in front of the court and saying, okay, um, who exactly diagnosed Tommy Morrison with HIV, you know, in 1996 or at any time, because when he died, he had no HIV and he tested negative for all the AIDS diseases. So, um, you know, it's not the widow that's making this up. It's all based on um, court records, testimonies um, and information directly from the experts in the field of biology, uh, virology, microbiology, not Tricia Morrison. Right, right. And they seem to go after you, which you, you're, you're yeah. my, the messenger. I've been following this case for a long time and do, doing my own investigation too. And it, it, I've came up with the same analogy too, you know, and it's just like shocking what you really find out about Tommy's case. And because, mm -hmm. I mean, Tommy, Tommy was awesome. I have to say down, down to the point that he was really great and I don't believe, I mean, all of us have, you know, something wrong with us to where we screw up in life, but I don't think Tommy screwed up that much in life. I mean, you know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> yeah, I do. And you know what? He says it himself in his books that he wrote. He, he, he wrote a couple of paperback books where basically um, he turned to drugs and drink um, because he had to fill a void in his life. He had just been kicked out of boxing and boxing was his whole life at the age of 26 going on 27. Chris, well, you know, and um, and that was his life. That's how he earned. That was his profession, um, and acting. And to be suddenly told you have this deadly virus, you know, people wouldn't shake your hand. They wouldn't stand close to you. They wouldn't let you in their gyms. They wouldn't employ you. You know, they wouldn't return their phone calls to you. He was just totally isolated, um, which. You know, in today's world, the COVID, you know, world, everybody, I think, can understand how depressing that can be for someone. And he turned to drugs. Right. I totally understand. I mean, it is depressing of um, how everybody's losing somebody out there to COVID. Kind of like um, I can say I lost my mother to COVID and it wasn't good and it's still like a struggle till the to to this day and stuff so i get what you're saying and i get how um back when this got bigger that the how the media was you know proceeding this you know and i really didn't like it because a lot of people at cnn i will say that cnn did kind of like they were like yeah Tommy Morrison you know he you know he has AIDS and you know I to this day anything that comes up in social media I have to say that I don't know Tommy did not have AIDS and stuff I mean he really didn't and 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 it's so um upsetting how people talk about how Tommy had this and that you know Right. Yeah. You know, um, I made a kind of little list and um, the people that are still talking about Tommy having HIV AIDS are the media. Right. Um, Well, none of the media are physicians. Right. Um, You know, ESPN, uh, you've got some woman there called Elizabeth Merrill. Um, She's not a physician. She's talking about it. Um, you know, the people that uh, in this case, if you have a look at the documents, Chris, you'll see that nobody here is saying that Tommy had HIV AIDS. Nobody. Right, right, right. And, and, you know, here we are in 2021. And yet, everybody still wants to speculate and say, and I, I have looked at I mean, look at this case files and stuff like that, you know, and and I see what I see just investigating everything. And yet people just want to talk the talk, you know, and and I don't agree with it. People at Fox News as well. I mean, because I mean, people are have been talking about um, doing a remake for Rocky Five and stuff. And so when Rocky Five comes up, Tommy's name comes up and stuff, you know what I'm saying? And so it's just like, no, absolutely not, you know? (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, and and that's why I'll keep fighting this because I have the post-mortem report that says that there was no HIV virus in him. I have the anti-mortem report uh, from Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital that also says that they found no HIV in him. This was before he died. Um, So it has to be cleared up. And that's why I've not given up. And we are going into our eighth year. But, you know, every year I feel more confident because every, every step of the way, I have uncovered more and more stuff um which has nothing to do with hiv aids but has to do with boxing like the the rules in 1996 Mm -hmm. um you could not actually draw any blood in 1996 the legislator had never even passed that so you could not draw blood to test for 
hepatitis C or B or HIV or anything. Um, there's a, a process that the commission had to do and they had to put it in front of the legislator. They had to um, get it adopted. They had to put it in the rules. None of that happened, right? So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been uncovered along the way um, of other things. And, and then, you know, as you know, um, you've seen the clips where he got um, indefinitely suspended in February 1996. And then boom, in this lawsuit, there's a document uh, dated July 11th, 2006, 10 years later, lifting that suspension, right? And right, then and he, right, and he got his license back in 2011, right? Um, well, no, he never got his license back. Okay. okay. He, well, except for West Virginia, right? Right, right. Um, but, you know, and then, and then you look at the court documents and you've got the commission saying, we never suspended Tommy Morrison from boxing. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> yes, you did. Um, you know, we didn't say he had HIV. Well, yes, you did. You actually you did. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it just is really, really strange how they're covering things up. And what's interesting, Chris, is that we're back in the Ninth Circuit Court, like I told you. Um, there are three judges there that need to make a decision on, you know, whether to have this piece of tissue, this biological evidence tested for HIV. I want it to happen, but the defendants don't, right? They don't want that piece of biological evidence tested for HIV. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a real interesting decision. Plus one of the judges out of the three was one of the judges back in 2016, who in front of him at that time had nothing but lies from the defendants mm -hmm. that they've now come out in 2020 and 2021 saying, oh, we never diagnosed him. Oh, you're right. There wasn't a rule that we could draw blood. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. There is a postmortem and an antemortem. Um, we didn't file them. Um, we forgot. Right. You know, why would why would you do all that stuff? You know? Exactly, exactly. And it's just like, you know, why why would you say that? What what was what was you know what did you get out of it and stuff? Exactly. Yeah. And, and stuff. That's I right. mean, why, yeah. why how come? Because basically you didn't get anything out of it, but you know, Tommy didn't get to fight a world champion, you know. Right. And a make a I mean headline news. I mean, you know, I mean, I think Tommy should have been the main champion to me and stuff, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, and it's just like um basically um, you know, after all that, I mean, what was basically when when he was going through this, I mean, what was Tommy's thought process of all this going into it and stuff? And I mean, did he, how, how did he feel about things? Well, um, the time that I spent with Tommy, um, don't forget, I'm the third wife, right? right. So, um, you know, I'm, sh I'm sure each wife has their own story. Um, but with Tommy, when I met him, he was extremely down. He wanted to get back into boxing still. Um, he hadn't given up. He got up every morning saying, you know, I'm still alive. What's going on? So his thought process was that, you know, there's something wrong. You know, the, that decision that they made back in 1996, there's something wrong. But when he died, um, he died on September 1, 2013. And everybody asked this, this question, well, you know, if he didn't have HIV, why did he die, right? Well, what happened with Tommy was he was thrown into jail back in 2011 mm -hmm. what, in what turned out to be a bogus felony fugitive warrant of arrest, okay? Um, and it turned out to be an $80 unpaid fine um and it was not a felony so uh, but the damage was already done he was already in jail for 30 days 
and he came out of jail with an insect bite to the side of his chest. And the surgeon that did surgery on him took a lot of major and minor pec muscle out of his chest mm -hmm. um, and left in his chest 12 foot of surgical gauze, right, to rot in his chest for one week. That so is we, just, uh, yeah. <laughs> the surgery was December 1. 2011 mm -hmm. we got home and it was supposed to be a one hour surgery in fact we parked in a in a two hour parking spot outside the hospital expecting to drive home after the surgery but no we were in there until december 8 and then i had to drive home he was in no state to drive and then the next morning the home health nurse came and she just wanted to change a little bandage on the side of his chest and as she took that off there was kind of like a little thread sticking out of his chest. And I said, no, there's still something in there. And she said, no, there's nothing else on my paperwork to change. It's just that little bandage. And I said, no, there is something in there. And so she slowly pulled um, and pulled and pulled and pulled. And I showed you a mock video of what pulling 12 foot of gauze out of Tommy's chest looked like. Um, the home health nurse uh, almost fainted. She had to lie on the sofa. I had to give her a bottle of water. A friend of ours who was with us that day, he had to take care of Tommy because that was the first time he'd ever seen him cry. Um, and he had taken so much pain throughout his whole career. You know, if you watch the Mercer fight and all these fights, you know, um, the Michael Bent fight, you know, he took some some hits, right? And But you never saw him crying in the ring. So this was the first time his friend had seen him cry and uh, he was in a lot of pain and that gauze had been left in his chest for um, eight days to rot. And as the nurse pulled it out, there was no painkillers, no nothing. Um, you know, it was, it was horrendous. And that night his leg gave way and his, way, his head went straight through um, a wall, sheetrock, and he fell to the ground and he actually fell on his neck. Um, and that was the beginning of his downfall. It wasn't anything to do with HIV, AIDS, or, or drugs or anything. It was that surgery. Um, so for 21 months, we were in and out of um, hospital and um, he was doing good at one point and then um, they overdosed him on potassium they overdosed him on iron um, they hung a bag of electrolyte um, of iv nutrition because it was hard for him to swallow because his neck was twisted and they found out actually in the hospital in omaha um, nebraska Mm -hmm. um, that he had paralyzed half his voice box, which meant that any liquids that went down were going straight into his lungs and causing aspiration pneumonia. Um, so it was just, it was horrendous. And, and he had to have a heart surgery about three weeks before he died. And they also gave him two medications that caused seizures. And immediately they took him off that medication. Um, right now, now, how did Tommy uh, uh, paralyze his vocal cords and stuff? By falling on his neck, um, it had paralyzed half his his vocal cords, uh, his voice box, and um, and that was not diagnosed until six months after he had fallen. You know, the the physicians in Nebraska were excellent. They really ruled out everything. Um, they were the ones that um, tested him for all the autoimmune disorders that um, could trigger a false positive on the tests that he was given, right? And so they were the ones that um, actually diagnosed him with about four or five autoimmune disorders, all of which can trigger a false positive on the tests out there, kind of like the COVID tests you can have a false positive. Um, but nobody had ever done that for him. Um, so that's that was his downfall, was that botched surgery 
and the 12 foot of gauze left in his chest and the head going through the wall. That, that's what happened. Right, right. Because, I mean, that gauze coming out just, just had to be painful on Tommy and stuff. And it had to be very hard. And yet, I mean, did they, um, did somebody ask how the gauze got inside Tommy to begin with or? Yeah, I mean, we reported it to the Tennessee uh, Medical Advisory Board and nothing, nothing got done. You know, there's a statute of limitations, you know, after 12 months, um, they, um, they lost the paperwork when we reported it and then found it and then we had to report it again and um it was just you know just an extremely horrible thing to go through and um should never have happened should not right not have right happened. exactly i i i totally agree with you now um another question i have is like have you kind of um i mean have you um you know gotten your goals done with what you want or is there more to go or um um no that's that's a that's a good question um as far as finding out information i think i've pretty much found out everything now um regarding the testing regarding the licensing regarding the people that said he had it and he didn't have it um so now basically um this case is filed on behalf of the estate of Tommy Morrison. It's not me, Trisha Morrison. Um, so basically now my goal is to um, get Tommy exonerated, um, get the media to actually state the truth, if that's ever possible, instead of fake news, and get the word out there, and then um, have the defendants uh, especially the the lab company quest diagnostics take care of the estate uh, financially so that his kids and everything that tommy had ever dreamed of could be fulfilled and so basically we're filling his goals um, for example he wanted um, monies to go to boxers retired funds because there is nothing there for a boxer to, to go to after, you know, after they're unable to fight anymore. You know, he, Tommy had children and, you know, to take care of his mother. You know, there were things, that's why he fought, was to take care of his family. So this, my goal is to make sure that his goals are completed. Right, right. And um, I mean, I'll, 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 I'm sure you're going to update when everybody when you find out something. I mean, I'll update people too. But I mean, it'd be glad I would be glad to have you back and for you to give us results whenever something happens because Tommy was I mean, Tommy, I mean, he was the best. I mean, I think one of the best. And he from what I see from other people is Tommy was like a big teddy bear. So overall i mean he was he was he was a gentle giant very nice with people you know he he even did drug rehab so everything that's left out there by the mainstream media you know hiv aids drug addict promiscuous lifestyle blah blah, blah, blah right that's all got to be cleared up and court records there show no hiv no aids show that he he, he did drug rehab you know, showed that he got his life put together again. A lot of people can relate now with, you know, how he was treated and what he went through. And, you know, we've been going through um, lockdowns and stuff like that now for what, a couple of years. Um, but can you imagine that from 1996 to 2013, a, a complete lockdown and people looking at you and not wanting to touch your hand or breathe the same air? He went through that and, and that was really upsetting to him. He had just a few friends that stuck by him through thick and thin. Um, and I still keep in contact with them today. But there, there were a lot of people there that were just there for when the money was there. And, and then they quickly disappeared and, and left him. 
Right, um, because I, I agree with you, because when you have those true friends, I mean, they're around and it's hard to have those few friends now that you, ha- I mean, that Tommy had. I mean, just because, right. I mean, when the money's there, then I'll be your friend. Woo. And then, right. no, no. I yeah. mean, yeah. Yeah. And then especially if you're trying to get off drugs, you know, he was the one that deleted all these so-called friends from his cell phone, right? So just to just to stop any contact with them because they would just bring drugs to him for free, right? To hang out with him, hang out with a heavyweight boxer all doped up, you know. So he knew who he had to delete um, from his cell phone. And, you know, so, you know, I expect those people to attack me, which they have done, right? You know, um, and he basically was just trying to um, do drug rehab and get himself straight, which he did in the end. What made Tommy want to go to drug rehab in the first place? I mean, what, what changed, what were, what, what what was it like a down point if it's okay to ask or yeah absolutely yeah um one of the things was that um in the divorce papers with his second wife it was a requirement that um that he you know tested negative for drugs to see his kid right and so you know when i found that out when we actually moved closer to that um child that was an incentive, you know, and I would tell him, you know, if you want to see that child and see it grow up, then, you know, you better do drug rehab um, or you're just going to lose a lot more time in your life. So that was a good incentive for him. And he did drug rehab. Unfortunately, he never really got to see much of his child, but um, but at least he did the drug rehab. <laughs> right, right. Now, um Another question I have is, how did you meet Tommy? Um, Well, you know, remember that in 1996, I was in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And so when he um, couldn't fight, um, it kind of opened up hotel rooms in Las Vegas for visitors to come to Vegas. But that was too late for what I was doing. I was bringing in airplanes into Las Vegas. And so... um, from that moment on, when I couldn't get hotel rooms uh, because of the, the potential fight that was supposed to be happening, um, I, I always remembered, you know, Tommy Morrison being the reason for um, pretty bad tourism that week, right, for me. Um, so between 1996 and 2009, didn't really think much of it. And I was in a different city altogether. I was in Wichita, Kansas and not, not Vegas. And suddenly there's a a Tommy Morrison on a rooming list and I'm the director of sales for this big historic hotel and a Tommy Morrison is about to check in. And it was the same hotel where George Foreman stayed and Steve Forbes. And so I would often Google to see who these people were if I wasn't quite sure. And, And then I thought, oh my goodness, that's the same guy that ruined tourism for me in 1996 right and then i'm thinking okay you know do i as i've said in other interviews do i give this guy the best room in the hotel or or do i give him the worst room in the hotel and tell him what he did right (laughs) so um ended up he he showed up on my doorstep and um and i gave him a, a pretty okay room uh, it was the same room that George Foreman had slept in a, a month before. And and I think the saddest thing was he was sitting outside the hotel and he had his head down. And I thought, wow, you know, that doesn't look like the guy that I just read up on, on Google. And we got talking and um, and it started from there. So the the person that you never want to meet, you end up meeting. I had never seen Rocky V, Chris, right? Um, right? You know, when I Googled it, I really didn't know much about it. And and Sylvester Stallone, you know, none of that was a household name in my life. Um, and so I was, certainly wasn't a groupie that was after autographs <clears throat> and stuff like that. In fact, he gave me an autograph and said, here, there you go. And I said, no, I don't, I don't want your autograph. <laughs> 
so we all he wanted was to be normal he wanted to have a normal relationship and when i looked at him and um i said you know what i'm not the right person for you you know from what i've seen all you do is drugs and women and that's all i can see on the media and and he did look down and then he looked up and and there was actually a tear just coming down his face and and he said no he said you're what i want you're what i need that's sweet because there are a lot of people out there that see tommy from rocky five and from his boxing life that you know obviously ask me sometimes because I, since I've met Sly and since I've met Dolph and some of the others, they're like, yeah. are they really like what they're like and stuff? Or are they really, do they really, are they really like that character? And it's just like, no, they're totally different. They're totally um, not their character and stuff. So, I mean, from yeah. what I see from Tommy, Tommy didn't look, I mean, doesn't seem to be his character whatsoever, you know? Right. And, and uh, you know, I wouldn't know what the character of Tommy Gunn was at the time because um, I didn't watch Rocky V till about two, three years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, but when I finally watched um, Rocky V, that was him. You know, that movie was about Tommy Gunn, you know, Tommy Morrison. And, you know, we'd be driving along in the car and he'd, he'd come out with something which was obviously from Rocky Five movie. And he looked at me and he'd go, hey, you know, you remember the, that scene in Rocky Five? And, and I looked at him and I rolled my eyes and I go, no, you know, I've never seen it. And he would laugh, right? He just enjoyed um, the fact that I'd never seen Rocky Five and he could come out with stuff just out of the blue, right? <laughs> right, so, exactly. And stuff. I mean, well, that's, that's good. That's pretty good and yeah. stuff. And, you know, just keep on fighting for Tommy and, yeah. you know, to, don't give up. Don't lose hope because something, something's going to come out of this. Justice will prevail, prevail out of it, you know? Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it, it had better prevail, right? Um, and I won't stop until his name is exonerated. You know, I promised him um, on September 1 at 11.50 p.m., 2013 and I promised that I would take over his fight for him um, you know you just have to look back on on you know interviews that he did you know yeah you know he said that he had HIV and then another time he said no I don't have HIV you know so the media have flip-flopped with him on everything that he said all the stuff um, I, I can guarantee you all the stuff that sitting in front of the Ninth Circuit Court, Tommy never even knew about, Chris. He never knew that the tests did not detect HIV. He never knew that the blood was frozen and, you know, in 96. He never knew that, um, you know, there was no regulation to draw blood. Everything in front of the court, he, Tommy Morrison, did not know, right? And that's why when somebody says to me, about HIV AIDS, I, I give them the link and I'll include the link to this interview too. And I'll go, just listen for yourself, right? And if you want a copy of all these documents, right? Every single document, just go to the court records. You can pull them up. You know, you want a copy of the anti-mortem from Boston, pull it up. You want a copy of his, you know, um, post-mortem report, Pull it up yourself. If you want to know what the rules were in Las Vegas in 96, go to the legislator and you will find out that no blood could be seized or tested in 1996. Just do your own research like I've done. But I've saved you time because it's taken me nearly eight years to get everything that the defendants could have told me themselves, right? Um, even before filing a case. Right, right. and I, I agree. Just because if I could, I to, to me, if anytime soon that I know a boxer and, and they know how to get a hold of a, the boxing commission, I would be talking to them and right. stuff because yeah. I, I would like answers myself just because based on Tommy, like, 
what 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 made you think that Tommy had AIDS and stuff? Right. What I would I would dig kind of you know more into this story just to be because you know it obviously he didn't have it and but they said that he did where did they get a, their info from right and from like you know if they heard it from somebody then tell that somebody to come forward you know right. exactly and and show us the proof of it you know show us even a photo image of his virus you know, for somebody that supposedly had the virus from 1996 to 2013, his body would have been infested with the virus everywhere you looked. But he had testing done in the blood, in sperm, in cerebral spine fluid, in saliva, everywhere, every part of his body he was tested for the virus, which is called the retrovirus in scientific terminology. Not one piece of virus not one piece nothing right and before before the uh before the well before the fight with you know mike tyson i saw the uh press conference and the look that tommy had it in his eyes he was really upset with himself like i have to tell everybody that i totally screwed up and stuff when you know i mean i don't think he screwed up i think that Right. That, that was, um, I think that was the press conference um, in February of 96 when he got kicked out, right? Yeah, that was a pre-written script, right, Chris, mm -hmm. that was written for him that basically um, was telling the world that, you know, don't look at me, you know, I'm not a good role model and all that sort of stuff, right? And that he had just been told that he definitely tested for the virus, right? Do you mean that one? Yes, yes, that one. Okay, all right. Well, um, just as an update to that is in court records, there is not one test that has been brought forward, not one physician that has come forward or one test kit company that has come forward with any evidence of that so-called test that he was given in February for him to stand up on that podium and say that. Not one piece of evidence, no, no physical, no clinical, no biological evidence whatsoever. And in fact, he, he was on the podium for that interview on February 15th, 1996. It wasn't until June or July of 1996 that um, a test even came out that would have even have perhaps tested for the virus, right? Right. So there's no evidence that that was a pre-written script there. And if you compare that to, um, you know, uh, Magic Johnson, you know, when he stands up on the podium and tells the world that he's got HIV AIDS, well, who's standing with him? A physician is standing with him answering questions, right? Right, right. Okay. But look at Tommy Morrison's situation. There's no physician standing there answering the question. Oh, it was this test. We did that. We did this. We found the virus. This is what's going to happen. None of that happened for Tommy. He exactly. was there on his own. Exactly. I agree. And so I just think that a lot of people in the boxing world didn't want to see Tommy as champion. But, you know, there were a lot of supporters that Tommy had that wanted to see him as champion, you know? and yeah. stuff yeah i mean it's it's sad in the end just because i mean tommy never i mean got that fight that people wanted to see and right. basically i think that tommy could have you know like murderized <laughs> like the, mike tyson and stuff that's what i have to say you know yeah so. Yeah, Tommy said it would have been a good fight, no matter what, right? People always got what they paid for, is what he kept saying, right? So um, it's a fight we'll never know. But um, in the contract, it's a multi-million dollar contract with Don King. And that is also in front of the court, right? Um, uh, you know, when you file a lawsuit, you have to put a price on it. And the price is part of that Don King contract. Right. That should have that should have been fulfilled. Right. Exactly. I agree. So, 
Um, I thank you very much for this interview. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for all your help and and anything you can do to get this story out. And um, certainly wish you a Merry Christmas for 2021 and and just, you know, let's tighten our seatbelts for 2022, right? And see right. what comes right. forward, right? Right. Right. I will ask you thing one thing before yeah. you go. And is um, since I've been wanting to ask you this, since Sly just did the director's cut for Rocky Four. Yeah. In an interview, Sly talks about that he's willing to go for Rocky Five. What are your thoughts yeah. about that? Well, that's great. You know, um, now I haven't seen any of the other Rockies, right? I've only seen Rocky Five and I've only seen it once. Okay. So I don't know, um, you know, how you know, how well a director's cut ends up being compared to the actual movie. Um, one of the, a couple of things I'll say is that I actually have emailed MGM Studios, right? Um, giving my to absolute total approval, right? Um, that, you know, they do a director's cut. Um, and then secondly, um, I guess in Rocky IV, they got rid of the robot, is that right? Yes, that's true. Okay, so for Rocky Five, I hope they don't get rid of Tommy Gunn, right? <laughs> That's right. kind of my, my only request there. Uh, but it should be interesting. And I'm glad that he is wanting to do that because he was not the director. Um, it was uh, John G. G. Avelson. Avelson, John Avelson, yes. yes. Yeah. And I was actually supposed to fly to LA and meet with him and... Um, he was going to show me all the uncut, you know, the, the parts of the movie that was never put in. Um, but John did, you know, he passed away uh, rather quickly. Um, so it would have been nice to have met him and watched all the stuff that maybe will come out in the director's cut. If that happens at all, I don't know. But um, I, I would like... I... I have hope that I think I think it's going to happen. I just have that uh, strong hope just because a lot of fans, hardcore Rocky fans more than I want to see Rocky five because Rocky five was underrated and right. a lot of fans didn't like it out there. But I, I like I like Tommy Street Fight in it. I mean, the music, yeah. the, the choreography with Sly was was really good in it and stuff, you know. Yeah, that's that's right. The um, Tommy would refer Rocky Five as the red-headed stepchild of the Rocky movies. That's what he would call it. And in fact, we were supposed to watch it together uh, because he was, I think, getting a little bit fed up that I hadn't, you know, heard of some of the lines that he was trying to tell me, you know, often. And he went to, um, it was a company called Blockbusters at the time, right? Which I think have closed down, but you could go and rent a movie. And he went there to try and rent Rocky Five, <laughs> okay? And they didn't have it, so he had to order it. Um, and then um, I think it just never arrived at, at Blockbusters. So we, ne we never got to see it together. Right, and I know Sly that it gave him the jacket from Rocky Five. Yeah. And and stuff I, I love that jacket that he had yeah yeah so. the balboa jacket yeah i've still got it and um i've still got a lot of stuff from from his rocky days and uh his script as well which he kept so yeah right right never get rid of that that's pretty cool no. yeah you know yeah. full of memories <laughs> yeah yeah so well, that's all the questions I have for you. And I mean, um, where can people follow you at and stuff to see your- Well, if, if um, Facebook obviously right now is perhaps, you know, um, a good place to come and visit, um, Instagram and Twitter on there as well, or even through you. Um, if anybody wants any court records, all they have to do is they can email me and it's Tommy and Trisha Morrison at yahoo.com. All okay. right. And I'd be happy just to send through to them uh, for free um, a copy of the documents that are lying in front of the Ninth Circuit Court. Um, so let's see what happens. You know, um, I've got uh, just so many people that are praying for Tommy 
and um, wanting him to be exonerated. And let's, let's just, you know, keep praying. Keep praying for 2022 for sure. So something right. yeah. something will happen and i am i'm i'm positive i'm a positive person so you yeah. know it'll happen for sure or soon soon if it's not 2022 soon so yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's already been eight years almost so uh but it will happen and um certainly wish you the best all right and and a happy new best. year same to you. Same to you. So and, I and anybody, anybody that watches this, I'm sure you're going to put it on YouTube as well. Um, normally what happens is any of my interviews with the updated information at the bottom, you'll probably see somebody else's video on there that they're making tons and tons of money on um, with all the, the mainstream media stuff. So please just ignore that. Um, what you're watching now is updated information. <laughs> Will do, will do. So much appreciated, and I thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Chris. Thanks so much. Take All care. All right. And you too. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.